In this presentation, let's look at spatial diversity in the United States and how we construct place. As Sujay Vega puts it, space may describe the physical setting in which community life is located, but it is more than environment or physical geography. Spatial elements are infused with meaning and become places. Place refers to space that has been given meaning through personal, group, or cultural processes. Places reveal people's practices, history, conflicts, and accomplishments. This presentation explores these questions through maps, nations, segregation, suburbs, public places, invisible spaces, and that space that is no place, cyberspace. What is a map? How is it that maps are not just physical guides, but also ideological ones? This judgmental map of Detroit, taken from the internet, uses labels to mark various places in the city and suburbs. The intent is humorous, but there's plenty of stereotyping going on here. Today, a key way that the world is organized spatially is based on the nation-state system, but this system has emerged relatively recently in human history. According to anthropologist Carol Delaney, we take it for granted that nations are the natural, obvious way to divide up the world, but only because we've been born into a world that is divided into nation-states. In this section, I want to look at the ways people conceptualize, use, and organize space, as well as the ways they use it. When I refer to spatial ideologies, I mean the ways we justify or contest spatial segregation and access. As Rogers puts it, the classification of physical space derives from the cultural map of political power. In other words, the very ways we classify space is shaped by power relations. The idea of manifest destiny was used by leaders and politicians in the 1840s to advocate continental expansion of the United States through a sense of mission or national destiny for Americans. Manifest destiny served as an ideology of U.S. expansionists during the period of the U.S.-Mexican War. Americans felt that it was their mission to extend the boundaries of freedom to others by imparting their idealism and belief in democratic institutions. Of course, Texas was annexed by the U.S. in 1845 as a slave state. The expansionist agenda also reflected the rising population and the desire to move into new agricultural lands. The reservation system, which we've already touched on, and apartheid in South Africa are ways of separating people into racially or culturally distinct spaces. Soweto, or Southwest Township, was created by the white South African government in the 1930s to keep black workers out of nearby Johannesburg. It also became a key site of anti-apartheid resistance during the apartheid era. The initiative for a competitive inner city describes a U.S. inner city as part of a city with high poverty and unemployment rates. Cincinnati is currently attempting to gentrify targeted inner city neighborhoods, leading to gentrification that may push out longtime residents who can no longer afford increased rents or property taxes. The French word for suburb, banlieue, has become pejorative, meaning slum dominated by immigrants. Inside banlieue are huge concrete housing projects, originally built for workers during the post-war period. In the post-industrial era, they've become concentrations of poverty, social isolation, and segregation based on group identity, particularly for African and Muslim immigrants from France's former colonial empire. 
Here we see border walls separating Israel from Palestine and the U.S. from Mexico. These walls serve to uphold inequality, exclusion, resentment, and violence. As we read in this module, gated communities are increasingly popular in the United States, often as a form of upscale segregation. Regulated spaces with highly limited access include prisons and mental hospitals. The Algonquin Club is a high-end, exclusive social club in Boston. A few years ago, I was in Boston for a conference, and on an unseasonably warm early December night, I was walking along Commonwealth Avenue and past the Algonquin Club. I saw well-dressed men and women through the second or third story lighted windows, drinks in hand, and what looked like a social gathering. I thought of old Boston wealth and felt that I was spying on VIPs who were enjoying themselves in a special place of privilege. Cities also represent very particular spaces. They developed in the ancient Near East around 4000 BC. Cities consolidated power but were dependent on areas outside the city. In the U.S., the rise of suburban shopping malls in the 1960s and 70s marked the decline of downtowns. This led to the rise of mall culture. How does this Middle Eastern market space compare to the Mall of America? Today, many now aging malls are under pressure from new kinds of shopping spaces, including the Internet. On the right, we see the new Liberty Center north of Cincinnati. Liberty Center recreates an ersatz urban environment, providing a pseudo-urban shopping experience for suburbanites who may be unwilling to venture into the dangerous city. Public places and spaces include squares and parks. The latter provide city dwellers with natural or wilderness experiences. Urban public spaces include sports stadiums and arenas and museums. Restaurants are semi-public spaces that bring together paying clients and different kinds of staff, some of whom are hidden from view. Workspaces include factories, where priority is given over to machines. How do you think that affects how workers view themselves in their work? especially when a foreman is watching from a platform above the work floor. When you visit a business, observe how the space is arranged. Workspaces also include office complexes where status and hierarchy are often marked by workspace. And then, of course, there's no space like home. Photographer Peter Menzel traveled the world to photograph typical families in their homes and also surrounded by their things. Here is a suburban Christian family from Texas. The cul-de-sac could be anywhere in the United States, but the cowboy hat gives it away. What does their home space say about them culturally? Here's some photos of a Japanese family home on the computer line into Tokyo. Where are we here? You guessed it, Mongolia. This family lives in a circular yurt. These portable structures allowed pastoral families to follow their herds. 